So it's Marsha Pally, Adrian Capps, Joseph Kaczynski, and Hugging the Club Union. So uh, uh, we'll start with Marsha Pally, uh, who teaches at York University, and her paper is entitled Table of Two Covenants, The Danger of Uncomplicating Constitutional Forms from Ontology. the last two minutes of the paper, which is very <laughs> compressed. So I thought it would be um, easier if I just put the last two minutes on uh, some PowerPoint slides. Um, and the rest of the, that's it. and the rest is entitled The Tale of Two Covenants, The Dangers of Uncoupling Constitutional Form from Ontology. Until the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the word covenant was the proper legal term for restrictive agreements that prohibited blacks and Jews from purchasing property in white Christian areas. Although it's a new covenant to be the bond between the transcendent and the humanity, and between the transcendent and the patriarchs for the blessing of all humanity, this was an oddly exclusionary use of the term. Covenant, the abiding bond between God and humanity now meant an abiding bond between some of humanity to exclude others. This shift became possible because of assigning legal meaning to covenant in Jim Crow America, the form to which the word referred, abiding or foundational agreement, was uncoupled from the purposes and context to which the word had referred. Now covenant could mark any abiding agreement, including those that ran contrary to the aims of covenant in the context from which covenant emerged. We call this a hoodwink. I'd like to suggest that this uncoupling is among the difficulties facing constitutional democracy. The forms of constitutional democracy deracinated from the values from which they emerged and the aims which they were designed to achieve. The forms may then be used towards any ends, including those abusive of significant portions of the population. Now I've gone ahead and uttered the word value, which disqualifies me from rational discourse among those who hold that the point of constitutional democracy is that its forms have no values. They are value-free or value-minimalist procedures that allow citizens with their values to live in relative harmony and this, paradoxically, is the value of value-free constitutional democracy. I find this an unproductive way to understand governance, because forms do not emerge without values and diverting them. For example, the idea that we should have procedures that enable citizens with varying values to live in harmony is itself riddled with values, including A, that living in harmony is better than bludgeoning each other to death, which in turn rides on B, the value of human life, and C, that each life is of sufficient value to be protected from the guy with the biggest bludgeon, either physical or power or money weapons, that constitutional democracy is better than might makes right, and D, that not only the individual, but the network of persons living together, society, nation, flourishes better with such constitutional procedures, and so on. These are not minimalist values, but values of enormous importance. If we look to John Locke, the grandfather of supposedly value-free formalist contractarianism, we find that his first, pres his first premise to be that persons become who they are by absorbing input from the environment, that thus their, that environment, society, is responsible for educating persons to the societally minded values necessary to live in freedom without constant control from the top. Those values are justice, according to law, civility, industry, truthfulness, toleration, and the submission of passion to reason. They are to be taught equally by mother and father, 
And should the father die without appointing a tutor, the public law, the public law, must provide for the children's education. Among things to be taught the children are obligations to the public good and the poor, a value so strong that Locke held the poor have a claim on the wealth of others. Finally, Locke's famous belief, brief for religious toleration, was not an individualist rights argument, but the idea that toleration is necessary for living in social harmony, a priority so high among his values. Indeed, his calls for church-state separation are so grounded in his Christian values that the philosopher Alastair McIntyre quipped that they could not be taught in America's public schools. Perhaps the notion that minimal values are best for constitutional democracy and currency because of the erroneous <coughs> conflation of large values with a large state. This error may have emerged from the historically contingent process of democratization of the early modern West as democratic representative government constrained monarchical and church power with their grand values about God and his political representatives on earth. The mechanisms of constitutional democracy may have become associated with dialing down on values. But the effort to constrain monarchies and over centuries to establish governments increasingly representative of a broad populace is grounded in very strong values. So what happens when values are uncoupled from the forms they generate? I'll explore the example of small governmentism in the United States. The idea of citizen constraint on central government, on keeping central government small relative to civil society, is based on the value of the individual, of local government, of intermediary civil society organizations, and the value of the importance of these organizations determining policy and practice. I want to note that the constraints on government were not based on the idea or on the value that the market alone and its ability to determine policy and practice is best. In the United States, one source of constraint on government is 17th century covenantal political theory, theology, excuse me, covenantal political theology, which holds that persons are social in nature. Politics is the art of organizing social life for, the mutual, for mutual aid and preventing abuses by the wealthy and politically powerful against the network of networks that constitutes the sovereign body. It is for this that Massachusetts enacted the Body of Liberties in 1641 to protect a network of networks from power abuses. A second source uh, is the Aristotelian Republican tradition, which too holds that persons are social in nature, that networked living is necessary for survival, and achieving our fullest development is our participation or comes through our participation in the polis. Freedom for Aristotle is the ability to contribute to society and government. As with the covenantalists, the unjust person for Aristotle is one who shirks the common good responsibility and grabs undue private benefits and power. A third source of constraint on government is the American tradition of liberalism which unlike covenantal and republican theory, holds to the idea of the individual not so much networked as free from constraint to pursue opportunity. This idea got a loud hearing in America from A, its Protestant heritage, emphasizing individualist Bible reading and individual little faith. B, from the immigrant experience, and C, the rough conditions of continental American settlement as many early Americans were fleeing the persecutory state, their flight reinforced the advantages of being able to check state power. The uprooting experience of immigration and the rough conditions of settlement boosted the advisability of individual self-reliance, but also local self-reliance on one's local community, and a certain wariness of outsider interfering at central government, which in any case was not seen as reliable because there was relatively little of it around to rely on. 
What emerged from these three traditions was America's hybrid, its liberal covenanted republic, which fosters the autonomy and freedom of the person within the common good, states, civil society associations, nations, states, I mean our 50 states, for the flourishing of all of those. Even given liberalism's influence, the, pres um, the president of the Theological Seminary of Princeton could in 1761 readily declare, quote, let your own ears, your own pleasure, your own private interests yield to the common good. Daniel Rogers in Contested Truths notes the importance given to the public common good well into the 20th century. America's liberal covenanted republic fosters a healthy democratic critique, even wariness of central authority. Yet government per se is not understood per se as equal. It is rather understood as the proper means for organizing society for the benefit of the republic and those individuals inhabiting it. Moreover, even constraints on government are not set because government per se is evil, but rather to preserve government for the benefit of the republic and its inhabitants. What happens when democratic wariness of central government is uncoupled from these republican and covenantal purposes? Critique of government to preserve it to preserve government as a means of benefiting the republic becomes suspicion of government. Suspicion of government as a floating free radical. It may be asserted as a good in itself, or it may be attached to any aims whatsoever. Importantly, whatever aim you attach it to will gain legitimacy by dint of being associated with the form of this time-honored American heritage of wariness of government. The new aim or purpose will make sense, feel right to many Americans because the form of wariness of government has indeed been for the Republic and its inhabitants for much US history. Indeed, it's part of the American belief system. Unless one assesses whether the new purposes to which you attach this form indeed benefit the Republic, one might not notice the hoodwink the switch. This is part, only part, of what's afoot in American right-wing populism. Gutting environmental protections, selling off public lands and coastlines for business development, gutting labor and consumer safety regulations, reducing Medicaid, which covers 74 million people, including 40% of American children, are explained as small governmentism these policies are funneled into the form of small governmentism, of reducing as much as possible government's footprint in society, government's programs and regulations. Now, uncoupled from its original values, this form can be used for anything. And given its association with time-honored wariness of government, it will have wide appeal and attraction. When Trump opened vast Utah land tracts to fuel extraction and other business, he said, and I quote, <laughs> oh dear, Mr. Trump, it's almost. Now, our case, page eight, page nine. Mr. Trump said, some people think that the natural resources of Utah should be controlled by bureaucrats in Washington. There we go. I want to close with a few short propositions about American populism. <coughs> so this is very compressed. This is the end. So I'm going to put it also up on the screen. One, populist worldviews and rhetoric are part of the culture in which they are located and draw on that culture's history, myths, tropes, etc. Two, Part of America's history is a robust, productive wariness of government and strong local identification. Three, duress, either material duress, economic duress, or sense of place, what I call sense of place duress, 
the fear that culture is changing away from what we believe make the best persons in society. That the culture that gives you purpose and a place that says what's fair, what's due you and others is under threat. This duress prods binary us versus them worldviews. Why are we <coughs> being unfairly subject to duress and by whom? Who is them who is subjecting us to duress? Under a duress prodded binary, America's healthy wariness of tyrannical government becomes suspicious suspicion of government per se because we've funneled it into this binary. Us in struggle against government then. Under a duress product binary, America's healthy localism may shift from my supportive community to my community in struggle against them. And who are the traditional thems? Those cheating, dangerous others, blacks, immigrants, today, Muslims. This, or um, one through five, all of this is deep in the American grassroots. The shift from healthy wariness of government and community identification to us versus them is an ever-running potential, more likely prodded by the rest, but it is there to be tapped by those with resources and motive to do so. To this, we may add the uncoupling of form from value. The form of small governmentism, <coughs> detached from its context and purposes, sounds like the productive wariness of government of American history. It reinforces the duress prodded binary, us in a struggle against government, as it sounds like the laudable wariness of government of American <coughs> heritage. Suspicion of government, its programs and its regulations. Suspicion of government per se, prodded on one hand by the duress product binary, and on the other hand by uncoupling form from value, can thus be applied to a wide range of public policies. It will lend them, however nefarious, the legitimate and feel right of American heritage. Thank you. I'm not sure how to get rid of this. Where do I click? Anybody know? Trump Club. Well, David, I'm so there we go. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next paper is uh, by Adrian Papps from the University of Kent. Uh, he will be speaking on Commonwealths of Culture and Shared Social Imaginaries, a Cultural Approach to Constitutional and Political Work. Thank you uh, very much, David, and as always, it's an enormous pleasure uh, to be here. Um, it's a rather long and, some might say, pretentious title, so perhaps I should have given it just a short sort of on the mixed constitution and, you know, its, it's modern destruction or something like this. But before I, I start, just two preliminary remarks, um, really to put this into context. So it is very much about mixed constitution, which isn't just an ancient thing, it isn't just Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and, and, and so on. It's actually the case that human rule over humans always require a balance, a balance between the consent of the many, the people, but also the advice of the few, however they are constituted, very corrupt or, or, or not, so if you like the aristocracy, which doesn't have to be hereditary, and of course also the executive decisions of the one. These are elements that never really go away, because if you think about it, the people are clearly essential to uh, modern uh, democracy, but we also have forms of consent in non-democratic uh, or non-electoral systems. We have some form of aristocracy uh, in, in all systems, you might call that an oligarchy at worst, or an enlightened, you know, uh, enlightened elite at best. And of course, we have the executive decisions of the one. Uh, and interestingly, that has to be uh, embodied in one person as it's still today. If you think about either constitutional monarchies or presidential or prime ministerial functions, but really, what's key is the few who play a mediating role between the one and the many. 
and in some sense in modern, uh, especially liberal democracy, uh, that element sort of drops out. Because liberalism is only able to recognize, as Hobbes perhaps saw with the utmost clarity, as politically relevant either uh, the natural individual person, so the isolated individual in the state of nature, or indeed the artificial conventional aggregate person of the state. That, of course, is very much a fiction, but that must be sustained through monopolization of power by the fiction's real person embodiment. So the state really does have coercive power over each and every one. So Leviathan's absolute, Leviathan's absolute sovereignty is necessary to guarantee the social contract and the negative piece of just a cessation of natural hostility. The freedom of the contracting individual is the prime side for liberal ideology. The sovereignty of Leviathan as the expression of mass will is the prime side at once for the ideology of absolutism, but also the ideology of modern democracy. It is suspended between the many real wills and one armed fiction of will, liberalism has in principle you know, tried to get rid of mixed government. And just for this reason, the shadow of absolutism always lurks over it. So democracy and absolutism are not diametrically opposed. They are actually paradoxically compatible. So that's one preliminary remark. The other one is about culture, since the title of the paper uh, suggests a cultural approach. And I want to be very clear, culture does not mean constructivism. Um, I apologize to all of those in the room who are constructivists, though I don't think there are that many. Um, <laughs> you never know. Um, but what I mean by culture is very much something which is, yes, of course, in part socially constructed, but also something that reflects certain material realities. Now, there is the sort of Benedict Anderson type imagined community. Right? Everything is constructed, invented, and that's just how it is. And it's true, cultures are up to a point invented and reinvented, representation and in the imagination, in books, in art, in music, film, and other popular expressions. But that's not all that there is to culture, far from it. Cultures also grow out of customs, traditions, institutions, and ways of life that are also material. So culture isn't just artificial. This culture is an inheritance that forms a common life, providing people with a source of meaning, often even a strong sense of identity and belonging. Individuals inherit this culture, and of course they also then contribute to reimagining it. I think the anthropologist Ruth Benedict is very interesting here because she describes culture as, and I quote, the raw material of which the individual makes his life. This is true, for instance, of place with architecture, the natural surroundings, but also food, clothes, and all sorts of things that are actually material. And that make up our everyday existence. And she says the loss of a culture is, and I quote, loss of something that had value equal to that of life itself, the whole fabric of a person's standards and beliefs. So these just as preliminary remarks. The mixed constitution that doesn't really go away, it just changes its form and its substance, and the fact that culture isn't simply artificial, it's also material. Now, where I want to start the argument, really, is with the very simple point that all forms of representative government have some sort of democratic deficit. Because every system of representation is in deficit compared with the rigorous standards of representation. Representative government. Why? Because no system of government, especially not at a high level like the national level, you know, can have a set of elected representatives that you know, who can embody the general interest. Right? It's very hard to represent everyone in you know, a fair balance way. You know, it's quite obvious. But of course, it goes further than that because there's also an endemic risk that representation becomes an interest or even a self. Uh, sorry, that representatives become an interested or even a self-serving party. Okay? You know, that's, of course, the problem with the corruption of the elites, you know, of which we hear a lot these days. But the fundamental point is that you always have a democratic deficit in whichever system you're dealing with. But then it goes further, because we also have crises of legitimacy, which concern you know, the lack of public trust and popular consent to how people are being uh, governed and ruled. Legitimate will transcend formal arrangements and procedures such as legal, legal order or elections or any of those very important aspects of liberal democracies. Legitimacy really rests on three core capacities. The ability to make a political system intelligible to its members. Think about how often you say, I don't understand what's going on in Washington or Brussels or any capital you think of. The ability to mobilize civic consent, to really get the 
the sense that people feel that this is um, done in their interest and accordance with their needs, and the ability to interest and even to engage citizens in public political debate and decision making, rather than the sense, you know, the political elites are all the same, you know, we've had enough and we're going to be uh, turning our backs on, on politics. But crucially, it's also the case that liberal democracy today, I think, lacks what Charles Taylor calls a social imagining. So it's not just that it's a democratic deficit, it's not just that there's a crisis of legitimacy, it's also that actually lacks a social imagining, which he defines as ways people imagine their social existence, how they fit together with others, how things go on between them and their fellows, the expectations that are normally met, and the deeper normative notions and images that underline these expectations. So as Taylor defines it, social imaginary is, we gather quote him, in fact, that larger, unstructured, and inarticulate understanding of our whole situation with which particular features of our world show up for us in the sense they have. It can never be adequately expressed in the form of explicit doctrines because of its unlimited and indefinite nature. End of quote. So social imagery shapes the way people who share it view their coexistence. In other words, all the normative dimensions of individuals or groups or indeed uh, collectives, their hopes and the mutual expectations that citizens have vis-a-vis -vis each other and indeed vis-a-vis -vis their representatives. As such, social imaginaries involve common narratives, they involve myths, they involve practices, and not just abstract ideas. They particularly involve how people behave towards one another. As Taylor suggests, the theory of social imaginaries must conform to the reality. In other words, the popular experience in the center of political rule, whether through constitutional settlements, in elective assemblies, or other forms of political engagement. Once the reality of a social imaginary has changed, then the theory uh, if it hasn't sort of caught up with it, neither describes nor explains the experience of citizens. And that's the problem. People just don't feel they live in a system that is representative because it becomes self serving. Right? Because elites are no longer concerned with the needs and interests of people, they can easily become just interested in their own priorities. And in today's situation, arguably, when the forces of capitalism, statism, liberalism, and globalization weaken, the nation state, then that sense of a lack of representation and a lack of popular consent is even, uh, even uh, stark. And indeed, it's changing the very nature of representation, which for a long time in the modern era was really at the level of uh, the nation state. You've got new formations, the market state, or the transnational, perhaps even the post national state. And what is the problem here? Not that we cannot imagine some form of representation of democracy, but for the moment that hasn't happened, and in the absence, we have three problems. First of all, the state is really disconnected from the nation, and the purpose of government is now not the provision of public goods, but rather just the managing of systemic risk. That's one feature. And so basically, it feels like government is no longer there to really help us flourish, it's just there to protect us from the worst forms of risk, financial, economic, environmental perhaps also um, when it comes to epidemics. Second, this sort of uh, disconnect of state formation undermines the social contract between precisely the collective and the individual in favor of different, much smaller social contracts, much more the level of groups so that we all basically slide into minority politics, which is then hugely exacerbated by identity liberalism today, where it's all about you know, tiny minorities, and there's no longer any talk about what binds people together as citizens, above and beyond very legitimate minority needs and interests, but that those, you know, common bonds are not really addressed. So the citizen increasingly lacks cohesion and a sense of identity, lacks a social imagery. Third, this sort of disconnect replaces national myths and narratives with some abstract global substitutes. Now that's no necessity. We could perhaps have much more embodied transnational global myths and narratives, but for the moment I think they're not really there. So the Western democracy then suffers a crisis of legitimacy, not just a democratic deficit, and indeed suffers from not having a shared social imagination. Now there's lots in the con social contract tradition that is um, important in terms of individual rights and liberties, but of course there's also uh, lots of problems. I'm not going to spend more time on it, I'm going to pass to the next section on cultural commonwealth, so the uh, sort of alternative I'd like to put forward. The basic argument, which Marcia already mentioned in her paper, is that what's really missing from much of the social contract tradition is a conception of humans as social and political beings. 
It means we don't just seek wealth and power, in the sense of abstract wealth and domination of others, but rather we seek mutual recognition. We associate around shared ends and who build intermediary institutions that actually constitute society. Now, one of the most important things in the modern era to try and develop this was uh, Edmund Burke. And what Burke tried to do is very much uh, renew that legacy of antiquity and uh, the Middle Ages to say we needed, we needed politics that is the middle way between the extremes. The middle way between despotism, which he clearly opposed, including the Austrian regime, uh, but also the mob rule, also the sort of terror that comes with the French Revolution. Politics for Burke is very much about limiting the vices of greed and selfishness and distrust. So he's very realistic in that sense, that human beings are very much capable of vice, but he also thought that we are capable of virtue. And so politics should be encouraging social virtues, generosity, gratitude, loyalty, duty, wisdom, all the uh, virtues that nurture the way we live in society. Because for Burke, appeals to abstract ideas like liberty and equality ring hollow. Not because he was against liberty or against equality, not at all, but because just by themselves, these abstract ideas overlooked the relationships with our family, with our friends, with our colleagues, with our fellow citizens, and indeed with strangers. The sort of relationships that can provide substance to otherwise, otherwise <coughs> vacuous values. As he wrote in the Reflections on the Revolution of France, the liberty, and I quote, the liberty I mean is social freedom. It is that state of things in which liberty is secured by the equality of restraint. That's a very different liberty from the sort of negative liberty where anything is permitted except limits imposed by the law or private conscience. What did he mean by this? He meant a kind of lived fraternity. In other words, the third idea of the French Revolution that arguably dropped out soon after uh, you know, it was proclaimed. The sort of lived fraternity of interpersonal solidarity, <coughs> which arguably both left and right have abandoned when they embraced the impersonal force of either the collective state or the atomized market exchange that together undermines society uh, to its name. A key to Burke's conception is his emphasis on covenantal ties between generations. There's, of course, this famous quote from the Reflections, which is, society is a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. Now, what can such a perspective tell us today? Well, first of all, it can tell us about balancing rights with mutual obligations. And surely we have gone very far down the path of individual rights and entitlements, and we're not very good at talking about mutual obligations in any sort of substantive sense. When we talk about mutual obligations, we just talk about responsibilities, but they're always individual, and they always follow from rights, whereas for Berg, duties come first. In some sense, rights flow from duties. But also the balance between contribution and reward. Covenants for Burke endow social relations with meaning that is missing from Hobbes and Hobbes' idea of social contract because basically there isn't that social embodied embedded nature which there is for Burke. We are embodied beings uh, and we are beings who are embedded in relationships and institutions, both good and bad, but we are not a social, apolitical beings to start with. Those relationships and institutions are rooted in people's identity and interests. Relationships and institutions, again, however uh, dysfunctional they can be, still on the whole are what commands affection and in turn what forges attachment. And affection and attachment is really key to any constitutional setting. Without that, you cannot command trust, cooperation, and you cannot command legitimate, um, legitimacy in the sense of uh, civic or popular consent. And without all of this, you can't really have a vibrant democracy and you can't have a prosperous market economy either. But what's also interesting about Burke, and this will be uh, one of my final points, I'm not sure how much time I've left, but yeah, just give me, give me two minutes, is that actually his focus on covenants and interpersonal relationships extends from domestic politics to international relations, and I think this is where it gets very interesting indeed. Because Burke reminds us that the strongest partnerships a country can make come not through treaties or trade, but through cultural association. On this basis, he rejects Hobbes' claim that international society is fundamentally anarchic. The sort of global war of all against all that mirrors the violent state of nature at the national level. The reason is that the most primary bonds between human beings are not confined to national borders. They're actually cross borders, which again, this globalizing area is perhaps of interest. Let me just read you a quote, and I'll 
we can move on with that. In 1796, so just a year before he dies, in a letter called the first letter on the regicide peace, he writes this, and I quote, in the intercourse between nations, we are apt to rely too much on the instrumental part. We lay too much weight on the formality of treaties and compacts. We do not act much more wisely when we trust the interests of man as guarantees of their engagements. Men are not tied to one another by papers and seals. They are led to associate by resemblances, by conformities, by sympathies. It is with nations as with individuals. Nothing is so strong a tie of amity between nation and nation as correspondence in laws, customs, manners, and habits of life. They have more than the force of treaties in themselves. They are obligations written in the heart. They approximate man to man without their knowledge and sometimes against their intentions. The secret, unseen, but irrefragable bond of habitual intercourse holds them together even when their perverse and litigious nature sets them to equivocate, scuffle, and fight about the terms of their written obligations. The cause must be sought in the similitude throughout of religion, laws, and manners. At the bottom, these are all the same. The writers on public law have often called this aggregate na of nations a common one. They have reason, end of quote. So in short, what Burke reminds us is that actually shared values are not some abstract ideal, like sort of liberty and equality with our relationships. No, they are only really shared values when they're embedded in customs, manners, and habits. And these very often cross borders. That's not just true for high culture, and philosophy, literature, and the arts, but also for folk cultural traditions reflected in food, in music, in religion, but also in tales like Tolkien or the Brothers Grimm. In short, the soft power of social exchange and cultural influence is important in its own right and acts as a force multiplier for the hard power of politics and military might. So Burke reminds us that these cultural congruences are there, they're very often implicit. They perhaps be pushed back by globalization and capitalism and so on, but that perhaps they are more enduring and that they are also a reflection of constitutional arrangements that cross borders. So we are not limited to an abstract cosmopolitan idea or some kind of politics that's limited to nation states. There may well be these cultural commonwealths between nations at different levels. Thank you very much. <laughs>
basic religious and philosophical convictions which are not to be found in many of these new countries. <clears throat> now, aside from their relevance, Friedrich's analyses have a certain authoritativeness because of the stature he holds in political theory history. Although many of you perhaps have never heard of Friedrich, unless you study totalitarian theory, he's sort of a forgotten figure. His impact on political science and public life in the United States and Germany is immense. There. Unlike many of the German-born political scientists of his generation uh, came to the United States, he was not a refugee from Nazi Germany. He came from a middle-class Protestant German academic family that studied at Heidelberg and then came to the United States and joined the Harvard government faculty in 1926. A prolific scholar for over 50 years, he published numerous influential books on bureaucracy, constitutional democracy, dictatorship, totalitarianism, and the philosophy of law. As advisor to governments and educational institutions in the United States and Germany, Friedrich significantly affected the political and cultural reconstruction of Germany after the war. He also was an intellectual architect of Western Cold War ideology and strategy to counteract the Soviet Union and communism. Elected president of the American Political Science Association in 1962, his enduring impact on scholarship and governmental policies came especially through his most recognizable students. Yeah. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, and Samuel Huntington, the author of the controversial uh, Clash of Civilizations, older students. Yeah. For Friedrich, the ideology of modern constitutionalism owed a great deal to the Christian tradition of ideas and ideals. Most distinctive among these religious ideas was the Christian belief in the dignity and worth of each person, which constitutionalism was to recognize and protect as a basic principle. Constitutionalism also required national unity and an effective central government, which was crucial, a crucial question for constitutionalism in developing countries. To these, he added Greek philosophy, especially Aristotle, Roman law as it pertained to the notion of rule of law, the state, and sovereignty. Constitutionalism likewise required constraint on the necessary exercise of state power. And this very notion of restraint, Friedrich attributed to the Christian doctrine of the inherent value of the individual that demands his protection, and by implication, safeguards also for minorities uh, against despotic or arbitrary <coughs> rule. Friedrich argued <coughs> that most of the general aspects of political theory developed in the West also apply to analyses of constitutionalism in emerging nations. Although he himself never developed an elaborate analysis of non-Western constitutionalism, his limited observations are quite perceptive. Uh, <coughs> he identified in particular the questions of legitimacy and the sustain, uh, sustainability, the suitability of constitutional democracy. He argued that the universal trend around the world to make constitutions was a manifestation of the search for some type of democratic legitimacy. Even a constitutional order does not, that does not uphold the basic principle of Western constitutionalism, uh, that is the dignity and protection of the individual, or does not even abide by its own rules, still provides at least a type of rational legal legitimacy. Yeah? And occasionally often describes as well the actual function of government in that area. In addition to legitimizing the ruler, the Constitution also serves as a symbol of national unity it's an integrative myth necessary for expressing and even creating a common identity or a collective entity. Such an integrative function is crucial in many emerging states because they were, as we all know, often constructed toward colonial rule out of very disparate and mutually hostile segments. The Constitution thus 
uh, also create a constituent group and a constituent power where such is usually historically lacking. But Friedrich posed the question of whether emerging nations can adopt Western style constitutions and equally important, make them work in the absence of this Judeo-Christian religious and cultural heritage. He had his doubts. In fact, he was surprised at the surprise of the architects of these constitutions when these new systems did not function as expected and failed to realize Western style political and legal order of liberal democracy. They should already have been aware of the difficulties of the Latin American experience where the vacillation between Western style constitutionalism, autocracy, and military coups uh, was the historical pattern. Friedrich identified the problem in other parts of the world as basically the conflict between the liberal and democratic principles inherent in liberal constitutionalism. Implicit in his thinking was that liberal, the liberal principles of basic rights of individuals and minorities were essentially secularized Christian precepts. Democratic principles stem more, democratic principles stem more from the continental tradition of Rousseau and the French Revolution, where the people as a whole prevailed. In non-Western societies, the leaders and constituents often had a vague and confused notion of constitutional democracy. Although they had a general sense of the principles of limiting governmental exercise of power and the necessity of freedom of political opinion, they also had believed strongly that the majority view should dominate. Consequently, these countries evolved into crises and conflict over which should prevail. The Constitution, that is the liberal principles of individual freedom and specific rights, or the will of the people. In some countries, the Constitution was eventually suspended. In others, basic constitutional rights had either been disregarded or the machinery for enforcement lacking. In both cases, the press had been censored, journalists and writers intimidated or arrested, racial, religious, and cultural minorities oppressed, and opposition groups repressed. Thus, in their popular expectations and implementation, most of these non-Western constitutions did not meet the definition of the Western constitutionalism, which for Friedrich meant liberal democratic form. In Western constitutionalism, one component does not dominate over the other. Rather, there is a constant effort to balance the rights inherent in the liberal component against the democratic will of the majority. The crisis of liberalism versus democracy in emerging states is aggravated in societies where there exists a rampant pluralism and a lack of the necessary degree of homogeneity. Under such conditions, constitutionalism can develop into civil war or the result in military coups. Often the military and related elites attempt to legitimize their seizure and exercise of power by claiming that they act to protect the Constitution, or that they actually represent the popular will of the people. They represent it rather than something, someone else. However, despite such rationalizations, coups usually lack broadly based constituents. And thus, they act as constitutional dictatorships in a state of permanent emergency. During the worldwide Cold War, in which Friedrich wrote, he identified another significant challenge to the introduction and success of liberal democracy in non-Western regions, Marxist ideology. To Marxist, the Constitution was an instrument of class struggle in the hands of an ideological elite, claiming to represent the true democratic rights of the people rather than to protect bourgeois liberal principles of individual rights. The Constitution, therefore, had no inherent value. It was yet another means of fulfilling the ultimate ideological goal of the common society. In post-Cold War 21st century, ideology of Marx's variety is certainly not the 
few exceptions, a significant problem for constitutionalism in non-Western regions. However, if we were to substitute revolutionary Islamic religion for Marxist ideology, yeah, Friedrich's insights would appear vindicated by actual <laughs> events. Here I would cite Turkey and Egypt. In Turkey, a long-standing modernizing system seeking the realization of a Western-style liberal democracy is systematically being undermined by the Erdogan movement. Liberal democratic rights are superseded by an Islamic-oriented value system, power structure, legitimized in the name of the democratic voice of the people, but which in reality is the religious worldview, uh, not of the entire society, but only a part of it. Egypt, on the other hand, is almost a case study of what Friedrich had predicted 50 years ago. Westernized Egyptian elites, encouraged and supported by Western liberal, political, intellectual, and media elites, sought the overthrow of an authoritarian system in favor of liberal democracy. That revolutionary movement <laughs> invoked the Western ideals of universal human rights and democratic popular sovereignty, as they were expressed in this wider development of the Arab Spring. All the optimism of that. A significant part of that entire movement did not consist, however, of westernized liberal elites, but rather Islamic groups who did not share the values of Western individualism. To them, democracy meant a constitutional system constructed and implemented along the lines of their religious worldview, even if this meant the gradual erosion of liberal ideals and individual rights. Indeed, to use Friedrich's words, one is surprised at the surprise of liberal Egyptian and Western elites that the outcome was not liberal democracy, but a movement toward Islamic authoritarianism. Friedrich concluded his 1968 analysis with a section entitled, A Glimpse for the Future. You know, this is the late 1960s, A Glimpse for the Future. To the alternatives of Western-style liberal democracy and authoritarianism, he identified a third course increasingly prevalent and problematic around the globe, anarchy. That is, the forces and movement destructive of all order. To stem this tide, Friedrich theorized about a future process towards greater integration in these non-Western regions into larger cultural entities of hundreds of millions of people. What would bind them together and create a new order in each region would not be a European-style nationalism, but rather their own distinctive common culture and traditions, especially those emanating from common religious foundations. Despite their very divisive pluralistic components, their common and religious heritage and principles of Christianity, Islam, Confucianism, Buddhism, would greatly facilitate their regional integration. Initially bound together as cultural communities, they would decades hence become effectively organized into new political and economic borders. To Friedrich, the decisive aspect here was not ideology or economics, but rather cultural and convictional bonds. The result would be a constitutionalism that resulted in the traditions, religions, behavioral norms of these cultural communities, which would not necessarily be commensurate with Western liberal democracy. Our final speaker today uh, is Arya Batwinik from Temple University. Uh, this paper is entitled Epistemological Skepticism, Textual Skepticism, and the Role of Constitutions. <coughs> I apologize for the somewhat unwieldy title, um, but I have in mind listening to these very good speakers and so, uh, you know, focused it more sharply. Arguing the defense in the thesis that 
constitution serve as uh, intellectual or theoretical mappings uh, serving in that capacity on a theological category that thanks to the human self-understanding and also for understanding the uh, structuring and functioning of states. And I want to be able to make this case to a unusual approach to the medium of a genealogical reconstruction of the relationship between James Madison and Thomas Hobbes. Uh, in an international political climate in countries such as the United States, Egypt, and Russia, their constitutions are proven to be uh, persistently relevant in raising the political level of the government and citizen, citizenry. <clears throat> it behooves us to take stock of what the strategic, moral, and philosophical justifications of constitutions are. The U.S. Constitution, with the core values that it represents, with the core liberal values that it represents, with, of course, some very glaring exceptions that we're all familiar with, in no way blocked the election of Donald Trump. In Egypt, the massive demonstrations at Tahrir Square, which expressed such deep, unquenchable democratic yearnings, failed to transform themselves into a democratic constitutional blueprint and sets of practices. In Russia, the collapse of the Soviet regime failed to engender a successful transitional phase to a liberal democratic or social democratic constitutional order. The least significant piece of evidence suggests that nation building connected with constitutional building are a relic from a bygone era that are no, no longer integral to capturing the dynamics of historical and political change. What historically have constitutions accomplished or failed to accomplish? And on what basis can they serve as a spulcra for political responsiveness and responsibility in an era when many of the traditional markers of political development and change are getting eroded and superseded? I'll argue that constitutions as the sacred texts of secular societies have a crucial role to play in rhetorically broadcasting and reinforcing what primary values suffuse the collective identity of a society. That's only one of their functions. The other function is to enable society to be a society. In other words, it's a question of personal identity and collective identity before it becomes a, a matter of uh, attracting support and creating the required number of uh, properly affected constituencies to constitute a, a, a national political order. In the US, the Constitution has served as a constant reminder that majority rule has to be tempered by minority rights, that the substantive values that many democracies favor have to be kept in some kind of realistic alignment with the formal majoritarian procedures that govern political decision making, which include protection of minorities. While protection of minority rights <coughs> can facilitate the election of someone like Donald Trump through the medium of the institution of the Electoral College, and also protect basic freedoms pertaining to the speech of religion through the immediacy of the First Amendment. By paper, I'll attempt to explore how and why the image of successful, long lasting constitutions is overall historical, uh, reflective historical equilibrium, a minimalist image to a discussion of the relationship between epistemological skepticism generally and textual skepticism specifically. This analysis should also shed light on how constitutions can be evoked for politically creative ends, despite the fact that the wording constitutes the limits of the earlier generations. How do you make the past serve the present? That's uh, one way of confronting, conceptualizing, confronting the dilemma that all institutions harbor. The U.S. Constitution was the first modern, first written modern constitution. How did it come to be written? Probably the most persuasive answer to this question has to do with the type of constitution that the British, the nation that the colonies, of course, were fighting against, the kind of constitution that the British had. The British then and now famous for their unwritten constitution. Unwritten does not mean that there was no text that could have enlightened British citizens about the context of public law in England. Unwritten only meant that there was no specific document concerned to delineate the scope and limit of governmental powers but only the general pool of parliamentary enactments and judicial decisions from which one could inductively infer where British law stood on any particular issue or topic at any given time. One of the perceived grievances against England during the later colonial era 
was precisely the absence of a fundamental charter outlining the basic distribution of governmental power, which would have served as a hedge against its continuing interventions into the daily commercial and political, uh, you know, commercial and personal lives and transactions of, of the colonists. In order to grasp the meaning and role of modern constitutions, we need to raise the question of whether the leaders of Whig opinion in the colonies were right in their projection of the restraining power of the written constitution and the power of constitution that was merely implicit in the rule of law itself uh, but would amount to a denial of fundamental human rights. That was their position. There, there are a number of interrelated points to be made about this reading, which call it radically into question. The grievance was uh, uh, not properly grounded. In other words, it missed the subtleties. One of the first things to notice about this equation of the absence of a written constitution with greater vulnerability on the issues of infringement of rights is that it is belied by James Madison's role as the chief architect and writer of the US Constitution. There is a strong relationship between Thomas Hobbes' substantive minimalism as he bends the wise and Madison's formal minimalism as exhibited in the US Constitution. It is one strand of both Madisonian and Hobbesian scholarship that draws connections between them, but it's a minority strand. I'm trying to make some contribution to that. The pivot of Hobbes' philosophical liberalism is the notion that all citizens can be presumed, can be presumed to acquiesce in the establishment of the political sovereign, because without this postulation, the organizing principle of liberalism, that political authority rests upon the sense of the governed, upon the consent of the governed, could not be operationalized. Given Hobbes' extreme nominalism, that it's not only universals that do not have an independent economist existence, but particulars also do not exist on their own in the world, but are constructed by, uh, by human imagination and resources of language and whatever sensory traces we confront in the world, there is no way a common medium of verbal communication could be established in the world left only to the momentum of human verbal interaction <coughs> without presupposing the role of the sovereign as what J.W.N. Watkins in a classic commentary on Biathan called the sovereign defier, who ratifies through his non-intervention the linguistic usages that have obtained currency in any given society at any given time, we cannot reconstruct how human communication becomes possible. For Hobbes, for all intents and purposes, the philosophical archetype of the political principle of no authority without consent becomes the political principle. There's no separate political theory in Hobbes. The, the philosophical insight is the politics. There's no discussion of, of uh, accountability and periodic elections. And that's a lot of famous critique on him. But I mean, you know, it's in Hobbes itself, it's self, it's self sufficient just to be able to point out the philosophical basis for uh, acquiescence and the very idea of authority. That is the the fundamental layer of consent consists only in that. And so all of that is required to underwrite the structure of liberal government. This is why the notion of accountability institutionalized periodic elections is redundant and alien to Hobbes' political sensibility. It is important to notice that for Hobbes, consent itself presupposes the very authority that authority itself cannot claim as its own without being grounded in consent. So human beings emerge from the clear light of day with a circular construction of their own fabrication. We, we are born in circularity. The, the authority consent formula of liberalism constitutes for Hobbes a circular construction that cannot be further rationalized or superseded. I think that Michael Oshat was right in calling Hobbes in one incidental so writing. He calls him in, not, in this non pejorative sense, as you can frame it, calling Hobbes a solipsist. One of, you know, one of the leading political theorists of the Western tradition is solipsism. Politics and solipsism are reconcilable, and the proof is Hobbes. Uh, thought begetting in itself through an intensification of self consciousness is all that is required to come up with a vision of a liberal society. One person, one, uh, one human being's uh, uh, analytical sharpness and imagination is enough to. Uh, project the vision of a liberal state. In Hobbes' political theory, the sovereign is there to guarantee security by his very establishment and existence, and again through his constitutional role as guarantor of the rule of law, to facilitate the pursuit of Hobbes' famous phrase, commodious living, 
on an ongoing basis in the primate sphere. Hobbes' substantive minimalism gets translated in Madison's constitution into an unrelenting formal minimalism. I think he, you know, he's a disciple. You know, you know, that's not an exaggeration. I think that that can be historically substantiated in terms of the structure of argument that they produce. As interpreters of the Constitution from John Marshall onwards have noted, the Constitution is replete with vacuous autonomous phrases, the general welfare clause, the necessary proper clause, the executive, legislative, and judicial power clauses, which nowhere spell out the full extent of the content or the boundaries of these different forms of power. Another systematic formal ambiguity present in the Constitution is that the doctrines, the doctrines which are the hallmark of the Constitution, separation of powers, checks and balances, and federalism, are nowhere stated in the Constitution. These are labels that we, that we have used over the generations. Those terms do not appear anywhere in the Constitution. The very structure of the document insinuates these classificatory schemes without explicitly delineating, theorizing, or justifying these particular types of distribution of authority and power. And power. What this state of affairs both invites and prefigures is continual redrawing of the boundaries between these modes for the exercise of power in the light of evolving circumstances and the pressure of immediate events. The way federalism, separation of powers, and checks and balances appear in the Constitution can also be related to a logical issue of reflexivity that is not in the least alien to Hobbes, and that now can be constructed as also uh, uh, animating Madison. Madison chooses the path of enactment rather than overt statement in communicating these three central constitutional doctrines because enactment enables him to better circumvent the contradictions that would follow from direct statement. The outline of the division of authority between a central government and local government comes neither under the jurisdiction of the federal government nor of local governmental units. All we would do would be to trigger an infinite regress if he stated it. Analogously, the delineation of a checking and balancing relationship between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government does not represent a checking or balancing movement by any one of these branches. Correspondingly, the enshrinement of three different branches of government, the presidency, the Congress, and the courts, does not constitute the exercise of either executive, legislative, judicial, authority, or power. You're opening a Pandora's box. <laughs> You're not able to fully uh, <coughs> um, uh, render uh, uh, compliance you know, comply, uh, by using the terms. So Madison circumvents the terms assiduously and rigorously. Apparently, Madison thought that the most elegant way to get around this dilemma was to enact in the formulation of the district clauses of the Constitution these three doctrines without thereby confronting the need of stating them. The net outcome of this, of course, was to further formalize the significance of the document and to provide endless wiggle room for succeeding generations to tease out of the document whatever they want. Another factor that might have predisposed Madison to act for a constitution of absence and emptiness, rather than one filled with specifically directed and fully elaborated content, was his knowledge of Hebrew, acquired at Princeton, where Hebrew was required subject to undergraduates in the 18th century shortly after the university was founded, and his consequent ability to read the Hebrew Bible in the original. One can project Madison, one can project Madison as noticing the huge gap that prevails between the biblical texts and the lives that Jews were living in early modernity, and however remote and attenuated a form knowledge of their existence became available to him. I don't know whether Madison knew that outside of Hamilton, so you have to suspend that, uh, that, that fact. And generally worded, but still largely archaic texts could be invoked to govern the lives of latter-day members of the community, as long as one noticed the pivotal role of interpretation in releasing and reconfiguring the meanings of texts. No texts were self-explanatory and self-translated. Using the biblical the Torah text as a model, one could even design a text, could even design a text. What's, what's sort of a, Unself-conscious in the biblical text becomes thoroughly self-conscious for Madison as a constitution maker. I mean, the hermeneutics I'm describing is constitutive of rabbinic hermeneutics in the biblical text. The whole Talmud is about this. It's about how you can generate unlimited, uh, you know, num uh, numbers of laws and bylaws and inferences and so on out of a very limited, uh, uh, you know, uh, textually open text. Text that opens in multiple directions. One could even design a text that would be mired in generalities and a menu of inconsistent applications 
I just want to approach it with a systematic hermeneutic that would enable the text to generate the applications that one was seeking. So, uh, so much for originalism. I, mean, I hope that it uh, now <laughs> goes completely moral. <laughs> uh, Paul Schmidt, in his book on Hobbes' Leviathan, reminds us that Leviathan represents an eternal fish that is supposed to nourish the righteous in the world to come. In other words, Hobbes' philosophical and political construction of the work that goes by this name, by Leviathan, is supposed to yield a state that would not be subject to revolutionary turmoil and upheaval and to bring a state once a conscious time, but would rather be able to endure indefinitely. What would be the source of its longevity? Hobbes doesn't address the question. Oh, but it's, the whole book is an implicit answer to this question. Hobbes' paradoxical answer to this question consists, I think, of what, what we have already seen. It is the very minimalism of the Leviathan, Leviathan state that is the source of its endurance. All the state ever has to do is, go, is to go on facilitating and accommodating to the best of its ability the multiple pursuits of commodious living that characterize the private sphere. The fact that the state continues to make and remake itself as it goes along without a firmly preset agenda of what economic, political, and social goals it needs to accomplish enables it to negotiate effective transitions across the whole spectrum of political time and to survive from generation to generation. Madison transposes Hobbes' substantive minimalism to the formal minimalism, minimalism of constitution making. What Madison advised from Hobbes is that in both cases, it is the emptiness that is the guarantor of eternity. He said openly, Federalist number 10, that you know, he's going to solve the problem of politics. The problem of politics which is instability will be solved because he now has figured out how a state can have a truly linear development. It has a truly linear development because it doesn't stand for anything. It's just uh, it's a philosophical construction in the minds of its citizens that allows the state to reinvent, reinvent itself continually over time, creating space for things to happen so that the process of state building is a continuous enterprise, confers stability and extends legitimacy upon political regimes. The state machinery in Hobbes and the constitutional machinery in Madison are do-it-yourself displacement mechanisms enabling the state to perpetually reorient itself in the face of new challenges and exigencies. Madison's enactment of the role of constitution maker demonstrates the functional equivalence between written and unwritten constitutions. So the sentiment of the Whigs was uh, misguided, and Madison had the right response. Madison gives the US a written constitution that approximates as fully as possible to the desiderata of an unwritten constitution. Phrases like due process of law and equal protection of the laws, among the others that I cited earlier, are classic umbrella clauses under which variable contradictory content can be inserted. The, set, the citizen it can have its cake and eat it. It can harbor the illusion of continuity. After all, you know, I, 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 I live in Philadelphia, so I go to And its history displays, as its history displays, this continuity. Constitutions do not save us, and they do not damn us. They merely reflect unrelieved uncertainty of the human condition. In a whole variety of forms and contexts, literal and metaphoric constitutions are crucial tools. Uh, because symbolic systems, mainly words, give us our only grip, the only grip that we have on ourselves and the world around us. In order to see this, we just need to explore a bit further the Madisonian Hobbesian connection. Hobbes' metaphysics provides the tacit support for Madison's enactment of the role of constitution maker. According to Hobbes, sense impressions and texts, so, so sense impressions without words, texts are words, <coughs> exist on the same, not only resolvable continuum. Our reading of texts is not any closer to being self validating than our reading of natural, worldly, and scientific phenomena. In a primary sense, everything that we confront in the world, whether officially consisting of words or just unvarnished, unannotated sense impressions, constitutes a text that defies easy translation into an incontrovertible in idiom. Seeking to lighten our dilemmas by reducing the number of texts that we have to grapple with by circumventing written constitutions altogether will not enable us to overcome the challenge of textuality because of the abhorrent manner in which we have to navigate both everyday and social and political reality. 
based upon Hobbes' extreme nominalism, we can make the case that there are only texts and no secure things that they correspond to. Based upon Hobbes' conception of the insecure grounding of particulars, we confront the paradox that a thing has to be a text before it can be denominated as a bona fide thing with a secure identity. Willy nilly constitutions exist in all spheres of human personal and social existence because of the fathomlessness and intractability of both diurnal and political reality. We need to construct systematically driven markers and handles for ourselves in order to engage both daily individual and collective political reality. To paraphrase Nietzsche, the given is the created that has survived in some form such a lengthy period of time that we have lost traces of its creation. Whether written or unwritten, fully drawn up or partially or wholly passive, constitutions in the broad sense that I have described them are vital for conferring meaning and direction upon human life in all of its dimensions, no matter how many times we feel the need to overhaul and revise them. Living without constitutions is living below the threshold of the union. The instability of some contemporary constitutions is often a testimonial to the inability or unwillingness of some people to live with uncertainty and their hankering for fundamentalist reassurances in both religion and politics. I still they call it taught constitutions. Yeah, I'm in my, my final paragraph. <laughs> I try to tailor it to the sequence. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, there is a, uh, a continuing, almost literal line linking together religious fundamentalism with political fundamentalism so that um, the, the resistance to constitutions, the animus against them, uh, is, I think, a, a fundamentalist, a fundamentalist predisposition because of the revulsion against uncertainty. If you, if you need a constitution, it means that you're creating the framework of the world that you're going to move about, whether it's an individual world or a collective political world. So an adjustment to a world of skeptical and ponderable values is what is needed in order to enable constitutions to flourish. Constitutions represent forays into the workshop for generating temporary guidelines and orientations. Mapping something constitutes the first stage of doing it. As long as we see ourselves as doers and makers, constitutions remain indispensable. We must defeat the periodic urge to certainty in order to make constitutions continually relevant. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. So uh, we have some time. For, uh, I think we're going to cut into our, our lunch a little bit uh, for some questions. So <laughs> take some questions. I, uh, I really like the talks. Uh, my question is, I guess, primarily for uh, Adrian and Joe. I'm interested in what do you think is the relationship of uh, religion to the cultural commonwealths you were mentioning? Is, is a common religion necessary? For a cultural commonwealth, or do you actually need a, uh, a common kind of secular liberal respect for the um, uh, mutual kind of coexist the coexistence of different religions? Mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. Well, it's a great question. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and I suppose my answer would be that a common religion would be, you know, certainly not a sufficient condition for sure. Um, I think where there is still a high level of popular identification with religious belief or practice, then it would I think, be a necessary one. So in other words, if one was to cut it out completely, then I think that would be very artificial for those who still think religion is very important to their everyday existence. Um, so you know, you say you cut it out in, in countries or regions where religious belief and practice is very high, I think that wouldn't that wouldn't work. But I think in parts of the world, say Europe, where, uh, you know, belief and certainly practice is not very high, I think you would probably want to have a sort of constitutional and political order that at least reflects some of the fundamental principles. And then the point about liberalism would be to say, where liberalism inherits those principles and contributes to them, great, and then it's a very important part of that. Uh, political and, and cultural order, where it completely negates that legacy and claims to somehow be self-founding, then I think we have a problem because then it's simply historically not accurate to say liberalism and then liberty. I mean, that's, you know, you can even go with the Republicans for that, you know, the kind of all Republican critique of and say, well, actually, there was liberty before liberalism, so therefore that wouldn't be right. You know, equality is not something liberalism invents. 
it may well add to our institutions and practices. But I think where any ideology, any philosophy claims to be self-founding, we, we have to be very, very careful. And so my final point is any constitutional order that claims to be self-founding, I think, is not really viable because it clearly inherits very long-standing traditions that are both ideational and material. And if they're not reflected, then I think there will always be a problem of, of popular consent. Okay, you had a question? Oh, yeah. You addressed it as well, right? Sorry. Yeah, I addressed both of you. Oh, this is good. Uh, uh, I want to clarify. First of all, I was giving a previous interpretation, not necessarily my own, uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that it has to have uh, a religious foundation, per se, a religious foundation. Uh, and with regard to sort of Western style liberalism, as I point here, even for Friedrich, he believed, although the uh, ideas of the dignity of the individual and so on forth had originated in the Judaic Christian uh, tradition, uh, <clears throat> they had become secularized, but they were entrenched in the culture. And the way I would answer that is, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious, but which refers to the religions of those, of those areas, but that new constitutionalism would emerge from the culture of that particular area, uh, each of which he believed originally had some of the religious foundation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does Friedrich deal with the issue of written versus unwritten constitutions? In other parts of his work, yes, not in that, not with regard to other, uh, uh, not with regard to emerging nations. He doesn't get into that at all. Uh, but when he does a general history of government, yes. He doesn't, he no, nowhere does we have a, a, an opportunity to uh, sort of relate that to emerging nations. That section on emerging nations is something that he added uh, on a book that had been revised over the decades. Are you just suggesting that, that that Huntington's idea of the clash of civilizations is coming from directly from Friedrich and he's not adding much to that? That's an interesting question. An interesting question. I'm just a bit on that because <clears throat> I, uh, before I was preparing for this conference, uh, I worked on Friedrich a lot, but I never paid attention to that section of this book. But I had worked on Huntington as well. And when I got to that, the similarities were striking. When you read that, uh, Huntington immediately comes to mind. And I began to wonder, as you did, listening to this, uh, I wonder if that was the origin, really, of Huntington's ideas on the class of civilization, you know, culturally based, larger units, uh, civilization, and so on. So it might be something worth pursuing. Okay. Yeah, I actually wanted to throw out an idea um, to your uh, uh, question. Um, because as listening uh, to all the presentations, one could hear um, the question, well, if um, nations, societies, air regions of the world don't share the history tradition of the West, is constitutional democracy a viable project there, which I think is undergirding your um, part of your question. And uh, so let me throw out the idea that uh, there are many ways to get to constitutional democracy, and they may not all come from the modern West and in other parts of the world. There are other traditions that will yield um, uh, parallel versions of democracy and representative government and so on, based on the history and the cultural development and the hobby choose if you want to rely on Bourdieu and so on. Um, and I'm thinking particularly um, from my colleagues that I work with when I'm in, teaching in Berlin, we have a sister relationship to a number of South African universities um, where um, South African approaches to the world, worldviews, religions, so a basket of all of those, like Ubuntu as a value. Um, are contributing substantially to the slow and messy development of um, uh, representative democracy, which, as you know, takes a long time and is not a linear line. And that's just a, an example of um, the evolution, the messy <coughs> evolution of constitutional democracy from the history, the unavoidable history, religion, cultures, worldview, etc. Of the uh, of the location. 
So I, I have a, a specific question and then just a, a small general comment. Uh, and a specific question is to Marsha. Um, can we talk about race? Um, uh, that is, when I think about localism, federalism, um, uh, I think at least post-Civil War, it's a conversation uh, uh, and a political movement often that's deeply tied to race. Um, and of course, if you think about it that way, the tension between the local and the national looks completely different because yeah. insofar as the national is defending issues uh, 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 on race, it's intervening for the sake of the local in some way. It's saying you must include these people that in your local community. Um, and, and then the, the federalism response is, 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 looks like keep, keeping them out. But and, anyway, so your set of values when you discussed what's at stake in localism primarily looked at pre Civil War uh, uh, um, sources. Uh, and uh, so I'm wondering where race fits in, in, in that. And, now the general comment is uh, something I thought about a number of, of, of people who were speaking. Uh, and uh, they, um, again, I just share a slightly different view. It seems to me that we live uh, in some odd way in this post-Trump world in what's emerging as golden age of politics and political theory. Uh, as people are writing, uh, so finally we're shaking free of John Rawls and Jurgen Habermas. <laughs> <laughs> writing and thinking and trying to address what's going on and organizing. Um, I don't know what's going to come of it, and I'm as upset about what happened as anybody else. But my God, you know, this is this is this is a, this is our moment, <laughs> uh, and uh, and I think a little too much pessimism is running through some of these uh, uh, talks about um, you know uh, the, the the problems that led uh, to Trump rather than. Um, uh, what the, the, the immense response? Uh, I mean, we've seen, for example, you know, the recreation of the Washington Post. Uh, Post was dying, and, and suddenly it's 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 necessary and back and performing. Uh, so and, you know, and, and then this thing about Thomas Piketty and, and, the, and the conversation that he's um, uh, uh, generated. So so I think you know we, we, we live in troubling times i don't disagree with that and maybe everything could collapse but but it's exciting for the of the <laughs> and it wasn't very exciting 10 years ago there are some optimists here by the way you just have to attend the right panel <laughs> <laughs> sounds like i'm pretty new to the but uh, um yeah uh so race um thank you for that question I don't agree that localism is primarily about race. Um, so in one sentence, my understanding of um, culture, I know there are hundreds of definitions, but uh, one important point about it is that uh, <clears throat> the stuff of whatever is in a culture yields productive and unproductive things said uh, schematically, there isn't a good America and a bad America, there's all of the historical and cultural development, and it yields to a wide uh, spectrum of things, and this is true of any other society. So our localism, um, pre and post Civil War, has, can be used, especially where there is a sense of, especially but not only where there was a sense of duress, as in the South post-Civil War, uh, for economic reasons and resentment, you know, we don't have to review that history. It can be used for exclusionary purposes, and that is one of the things that is happening with localism today. But localism has, doesn't, all, isn't always used for nefarious purposes. Um, one of the great ideas of federalism is that localities and states would be laboratories for the various trying out, uh, trying out of various policies. So you get states and localities who have greater environmental protection than federal legislation, who have higher education standards for their public schools than, right, and we can go down that list. So um, uh, I, I think the idea of localism and the reality of localism in American history has had a range of outcomes and uh, what I'm concerned about and was trying to point to in my talk is that 
localism in America came with a certain context, right? It had all the historical um, predecessors. It came with certain values and contexts that, uh, yes, my community, but my community doesn't mean the same thing as my community against others. And there's a switch when you have my community to my community against others. And you, we have many examples today of my community where there's strong local identification that is highly inclusive, like church leadership in refugee sanctuary cities and immigrant resettlement, where there is both strong local identification of the local church or faith-based organization or community, secular community organization, and yet it is highly inclusive. So um, I don't think it's a simple story that localism means exclusion. Localism has positive and negative and productive and a range of outcomes, and that localism itself does not mean exclusionism. <clears throat> I, I, I thought, you know, it's a really interesting point about how, you know, we've sort of finally left behind, as you say, both the rules, you know, have a massive and sort of, you know, academic hegemonies, and that is surely a good thing because it opens up the space. Uh, the question, of course, is whether that will reshape not just academic research, but also, you know, public political discourse and, and actual politics. And it's sort of, it's, it's like, it feels like a Gramscian moment of interregnum. So the hegemony has come to an end. You know, economic, political, and so on, but it's not clear what will replace it. We're in this war position, and it could be something very problematic replacing it, or something very, you know, very positive and hopeful. And I think that's generally at stake. Um, but I think in order for, for something better to emerge, I think it can't just be a question of, and I'm not suggesting that's your your uh, suggestion, but it can't just be a question of. Well, let's do a bit better than walls and have with us. You know, it has to be quite a fundamental rethink, uh, it seems to me, because otherwise we are ending up with something which simply corrects at the margins. So, you know, for liberalism to say, well, you know, okay, the walls you have a massive model hasn't worked so well, you know, what are the sources for, for a liberal renewal? I don't know, to be honest. There's some strands of liberalism that are very interesting, but very often they're very hybrid. You know, Tocqueville. Uh, you know, Constant, Guizot, Burke, you know, they're all very hybrid thinkers. They're not liberals, they're not conservatives. It's not clear that there's an easy renewal for liberalism. And the extremes, I think, are the ones that are resurging. You get a kind of nationalist traditionalism, Steve Bannon, if you like, to put them into it. And, and on the other end of the spectrum, you get, at the other end of the spectrum, you get a kind of tech utopianism, accelerationism, right? Human enhancement by, by technology. And, you know, those two, you know, at the moment are politically resurgent. And the center is quite quite empty. And I'm worried that if nothing good fills the center, those extremes, which are kind of libertarian, authoritarian, I mean, it's a very strange combination. They could easily become politically, you know, if not hegemonic, but very, very dominant. So I think you're right. There's a huge renewal, but it could end up, you know, something very, very problematic. Russell, Russell, Greg. So briefly, on localism, understood as federalism, I think there's a really interesting reversal taking place. Historically, we grew up with the notion of states' rights as deeply conservative and national. Now, in this, under this administration, all of a sudden, the Democrat capital, the Democratic states, are claiming states' rights, say, on issues like sanctuary cities. So whatever come, emerges from all of this, the relationship between the states and Washington is going to be changed. Some, I'm scrambling that I just cannot foresee the outcome. But something's in motion there. First question, uh, Thomas may have already uh, anticipated this. Uh, Adrian, a little bit more about um, Burke's um, prioritization of what religion, manner, and custom. Mm -hmm. uh, um, doesn't this get pretty close to the Muslim ban uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the relationship of a country to? Uh, uh, it works well for the traditional Anglosphere, maybe, but if it goes beyond that, uh, the Commonwealth comes to an end. And then uh, to um, to Joe, um, I understand you're only reporting the thing, but don't hide behind that. If one takes the argument that the notion of liberal democracy, constitutional democracy, human rights, whatever, is Western, Judeo Christian, however, and it's going to be inimical into other cultures, 
what uh, what's our relate what's our liberal democratic relationship to the dissidents in those countries? Do we write them off as you know you just get the Erdogan's program or or or, or, or stay in Turkish jails, or do we have some kind of solidarity short of intervention? <laughs> This has been a perpetual question and dilemma through several of our Telos conferences, right? This contradiction between the universal, right, and the other. Because on one hand, uh, I said, even in your talk earlier uh, about uh, the, the cultural basis of the uh, and, and so universal, universal, right? Uh, I think that uh, I don't have a preaching answer, but I can sort of give you my own. If you're the Please. Of the <laughs> without, without hiding. <laughs> I, I would like to see the entire world to have liberal democracy. I, yeah. I do. I do believe that uh, freedom is a good thing, right? Uh, freedom of expression and so on and so forth. Uh, that uh, individual rights should be protected, the individual and so on and so forth. Uh, but realistically, I don't see how that can be done. And you know, if you take uh, sort of Huntington's perspective, then, that in itself it represents a kind of cultural imperialism, would be for my part. With regard to dissidents, uh, you, uh, I know, I do feel for them. I do have concerns about what's going on in Turkey, um, and but you, you, we've been involved politically in terms of foreign policy over the last more than half century in so many ventures. We try and fulfill those ideals and so on and so forth, and it led to some catastrophe after catastrophe. And too often, what we need behind are our, our governments that are collapsing, lack of order, more anarchy, and a lot of landmines you know, in, in, in places. So I'm tired. You can, uh, I, I've become uh, much more reserved uh, in that. On the other hand, I think that wherever we can possibly encourage in those regions, uh, those kinds of ideals or those rights or support that without creating, making it worse or without getting us involved in something that's going to be a catastrophic you know, military pension and things like that, that it should be done. And I recall in Ireland at this conference or another conference that some of the dissidents in, in Eastern Europe who said, uh, you yeah, know, we realized you weren't going to come to our assistance. Was, was not going to move into Eastern Europe and so on and so forth. But it was very important for us to know that we spoke out in favor of our dissent and our rights and so on and so forth. That meant a lot to us. It gave us a kind of moral encouragement. Because there might be a process in these other regions where the, the uh, influx of certain Western ideas might actually have a positive role. Uh, so we might not end up with a Western style constitutional system, but they could borrow certain ideas, take certain initiatives, and it was done through, through, through dissidents and things of that sort, or uh, by your actions, the actions of the American government in one way or another, you might at least uh, alleviate the worst form of oppression on them and so on. So you don't abandon that. It's just that um, it's a recognition of the limits of what we can do. Just, just on Burke, one sentence, which is he didn't just talk about didn't just talk about religion, customs, and manners. He also talked about universal humanity and justice. It was so much a balance that he was arguing for. And axial age would suggest that there are universal principles. You know, dignity of the person, no humiliation, no betrayal. You know, that you find in very different cultures and, and civilizations. So I think one could balance those elements. Um, we're really at the end of time, so what I, I think what I'll do is we'll, we'll break and. Donna. Yeah. Donna. Donna and Robert, just please give one comment each, and that, that'll be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, no, Adrian, uh, the basis of Commonwealth is friendship. Yeah. And friendship is not a, something I don't think has been discussed enough. Uh, and there was one example in the 20th century to create a Commonwealth based on friendship. That's the British Commonwealth. Uh, that's the SMUCS idea in 1917 as opposed to Arnold with Imperial Federation. And sadly, it didn't work. 
that when you get to the 1960s with the Commonwealth, two things destroyed. One, Smuts himself, because he was one of the architects of apartheid, and the other were the new nations coming into the Commonwealth who didn't have the shared traditions and values and uh, soon gave up their, their representative systems. So we do have sort of, uh, it has been floating around internationally, and it's still there, so that's a very pale form of what the problem is today. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to uh, tell uh, Joe that in fact uh, the Americans were in Eastern Europe, uh, for example, Sealy to our weather. That's a part of the APA supported by the CIA. And uh, they're very, very um, present. But what I was to say to what Paul mentioned about being pessimistic, that's a very true, but uh, it's, it also goes to the panelists, because uh, the three of them, um, three of, with the exception of Marsha, relied on Hobbes, not on Locke. Hobbes is such a pessimist, such a fearful person who accepts ruling out of fear, out of the state of nature. If we don't give all our freedoms to the sovereign, where are we going to be? So that goes also to Madison, who had a tremendous fear of the mob. So if our influence on constitutionalism is to follow our Western world model, because otherwise it's chaos, out of fear, of course that we are going to have people dissidents at a door. The only thing that was modernized in Turkey was the army. That was modernized. The people were still there. No one actually asked the Turkish people to be a part of that constitutionalism. So I'm going for your speech, if you don't mind. And why helps him with law? And Marsha, thank you for focusing on law. <laughs> You're welcome. You. <laughs> yeah, and secrecy is my concern. Um, that can a constitutional democracy function well under uh, too much secrecy, lying, deceit, dishonesty, things like that, like Congress making all their decisions, not in regular order, but behind closed doors, uh, the, the executive uh, conducting uh, maybe covert operations in other countries that Americans don't know about, but the people in those other countries know full well what's happening to them. Uh, things like that. Secrecy, how does that function in a constitutional democracy? How big a danger is that to a well-functioning constitutional democracy? Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. I want to respond to the Don's point. Um, the, um, uh, Hobbes has, sorry it's not, but Hobbes even more s systematically and subconsciously, a multi-dimensional account on the transition from the state of nature. State of nature is, is a thought experiment for Hobbes, unambiguously, and, Hob and Locke has a certain amount of ambiguity surrounding that, but Hobbes has no ambiguity, he's like John Rawls. And, uh, the, uh, um, and the multidimensionality consists, I was, I was trying to give a, a, a quasi-exhaustive account of just one dimension. There is just a philosophical pace for the movement into uh, the, the, uh, the, state, the uh, social contract society. And on the level of moral psychology, what I'm saying is important. I mean, the way you analyze the relationship between these other passions, the passions predominate. So fear is one of the passions. I mean, it's what's a negative passion that makes us reluctant to engage in new projects and so on. He certainly takes that into account, but he wants to give us, uh, you know, an account that that uh, converges from multiple starting points. And what I was focusing on was one major, generally overlooked starting point that really sort of, I think, establishes a, a significant bridge with Madison, uh, who also, as you say, has the same fear, but also is therefore a need for that compensatory multidimensionality to make his account more persuasive. And I think it's there, that extra dimension. Okay, thank you. So how do you get the last word? Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to thank uh, everybody that worked to put this together. Uh, Mary Tony, uh, Rob Richardson.